cue the cue the uh, words coming up on the screen. A long time ago, oh, I think there might be a copyright infringement for that. Last week, Matt and Eric went through part two of Mary Mother Lewis. <laughs> Boy, I'm so happy you didn't write Star Wars because I don't think that would have sold a dime. <laughs> I just have one thing to say. R- 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 recap. Last time on Meriwether Lewis Part 2. They're starting to get that bug in their ear, too, of like, when do we get there? They see the Rockies. They've seen the Rockies for a while, but they're just so far off. And they're starting to think, like, how big is that mountain range? Thank you for listening to the recap for Part 2. Welcome to Ranking 76. We're Ranking 76 Heroes and Villains of the American West. Hi, Merrick. I'm Matt. And we're on the final episode of Meriwether Lewis. They've almost reached the ocean. Where did we leave off? We left off with them. Oh, uh, Sacagawea connected with her brother. Yeah. Literally the best thing that could have happened to him. Yeah, like the absolute uh, best case scenario, where if you were writing a, a manuscript, you uh, would probably throw that part out because it'd be too cheesy. It's too right. unbelievable. It's too unrealistic. That never would have happened. Well, let me tell you, it definitely happened. And they got horses, right? Yep, they needed horses. Uh, do you know what they still need to do other than reach the ocean? What's the main main goal here? Get their journals back. Uh, well, eventually, they they have to go through the Rocky Mountains. Still, those are still right. <laughs> still a thing. And to Lewis's dismay, there is no North Passage. There is not. Which everyone from Christopher Columbus believed that there was this easy all water route, and it's butt kiss. Nothing's he, out there. He got on top of that hill just to see land. God, that would suck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can joke about it, you know. Two hundred. Come on, guys! Later. The water's this way. <laughs> oh crud! What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I can't remember. Oh yeah, yeah. I was just about to say I can't remember if uh, Clark caught up with him, but of course he did. He did because that was where Sacagawea was. Because who wouldn't want to bring the only native speaker? <laughs> who wouldn't want them to stay behind? No, nah, we got it. The only person with experience of the land and like knowledge of the language. No, we'll leave her back at the the party. That's fine. They'll catch but up. Wait, eventually. before we leave, can I get one word? <laughs> <laughs> what was that word? <laughs> it was tabu tabune tabone tababone tababone tababone. I encourage everyone listening to this, just go up to uh, anyone, the next person you see in the street, and just uh, start tapping your forearm and say, Tabba Bone. <laughs> because if you remember it, that means stranger. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you'll get the same looks Lewis got, too. <laughs> that is that is also kind of unrealistic. Like, <laughs> hey, I'm looking for the word friend. I don't understand, so I'm going to give you stranger. <laughs> what do you mean, friend? We're the Shoshone. We've only been picked on. Don't you think Lewis would have known? He should have known something was up when that dude took off. <laughs> well, the, the Shoshone had been pushed around by multiple tribes. So, like, they're just they're just scared. It didn't matter who it was. They were going to run. If Sacagawea's baby, Jean Baptiste, would have been crawling towards them, they would have been skittish. Freaking Jean Baptiste. What did he do? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I, I, I thought that was the name of her husband, too. No, that's Trushant Charbonneau, the oh, Frenchman. Yeah. <laughs> what did what? he do? Uh, what did he do? Oh, man. Woo. I, I mean, meant her true. husband. I meant her terrible husband. I mean, he Lewis was not a fan. Before we leave, I will sing to Boots. To, to what? <laughs> Two bits. 
have no idea what you're saying. Boots. Lead the boots. The boats. Yes, he will sink the boats. Oh, my goodness. I, we're, this is an audio podcast. We almost needed subtitles. <laughs> oh, man. Whew. Anyways. All right. Enough about that. Let's get into the final conclusion. The final section. Do you remember how many people you thought would die? I said, besides the gentleman that died in Iowa, I said eight more. Still feeling good about that? And so far, approximately zero have died. (laughs) I mean, Clark really tried hard to kill Sacagawea, but let her dry. Oh, that's true. I I forgot. I was like, where are you going with this? But yes, he did almost bleed bleed her dry. Yes, this is true. Still feeling good with that? Don't want to alter it? Still going Um, eight died? Can I change my answer? Sure. I'm going to change it to uh, zero. (laughs) All right. It it sounds like they're all good. I mean, literally eight. Well, I don't know. They don't know the Rockies, and it's pretty tall. I'm going to say two. Two. All right. Two. Two is a new act. Big step down from eight. <laughs> I feel like the eight was uh, not not a big vote of confidence. Well, that was before really. half of them went, went home, too. Well, That's 12, true. but. That's true. All right. Now we can continue. I have, have that. I just wanted to make you feel foolish about your eight. <laughs> <laughs> I have succeeded. I should have known when you said. Oof, what's the bloodbath or whatever you said? <laughs> okay, now the expedition have their horses from the Shoshone and the expedition camp for a week or so before they head out. They believe it's only about a week out from the Nez Perce, but they'll have to travel through really rough terrain. Now they're actually going up into the mountains for the first time of the bitter roots. The terrain that they haven't really experienced back out east before, simply there is nothing like the Bitterroot Mountains that they have encountered. Lewis wrote in his journal, quote, through thickets of which we are obliged to cut a road over rocky hillsides, which our horses were in perpetual danger of slipping the terrain and destruction up and down steep hills with the greatest difficulty and risk. We made seven and a half miles in a day. That's just walk even even worse even worse than when they started going 10 miles yeah and that's a walking oh my god that's terrible oh yeah it, that it's not pleasant uh and they haven't really even started yet but don't worry they have a guide and the the name is old toby <laughs> <laughs> oh let me guess he's in hr but don't Yes. <laughs> Shut up, Toby. I didn't even, I've never connected that before. But oh, it's perfect. We hate you, Toby. <laughs> I mean, they enter the mountain in pretty good spirits, but boy, does that take a turn <laughs> real quick. So they inch their way into the mountains and they even pass a small native tribe where they gain even more horse- horses on September 3rd. So, hey, good news. Old Toby, doing your job, buddy. Yeah, woo! Now remember, they're only a couple of days from the Nez Perce. Now they, it's about a week, but they know it's going to be really hard. That's what's in their brain. This is going to suck, but it's only going to suck for a week. Come on, Toby, into the woods. Then old Toby starts giving them some news. Well, for starters, uh, the Missouri River that they just crossed, uh, following it all the way up to the source, per demands of Jefferson... Uh, they they actually missed a shortcut that would have taken them uh, four days. Uh, would have cut off four days? Uh, no, it would have been four days total. No. The expedition actually traveled for 53. And it would have only took them four days? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I would want to throw up. <laughs> like I would, I would almost go on strike. Uh, um um how, how short how short you talking <laughs> oh brutal we would have still had the rum <laughs> so with that news out of the side there's nothing they can do about that but they can only go and continue the the run so the party leaves on september 10th and by september 14th it's already rained and then hailed and then it snowed did they even did they even equip themselves with like winter gear Oh uh, yeah, I mean they have. Like, did they expect snow and stuff? 
Well, I mean, they've been attacked by about 47 grizzlies at this point. Right. They, so they have they have some pelts. They have some elk hide. They, they're they ready as they, okay. you would expect. You okay. also got to remember, they're trading with all of these tribes. So, no. Right. Their supplies are getting, you know, smaller and smaller. But, yeah, they're, they're as equipped as they can be. Um, but then they start walking. And maybe they notice that I think we've passed that tree like four times. What is? Oh, no. Seriously, I I dropped this handkerchief last time we were here. Uh, this are we? Yeah, old Toby lost the trail. And Damn for, it, Toby. And for two days, Toby let them astray. They so they just walked them. around in circles for two days. Yeah, they couldn't really find the trail for a couple days, so. That seven days is now nine. Even worse, um, it's still snowing, uh, including in one day it snowed up to eight inches. Oh, wow. Worse yet, just like the Donner Party, there is a very little game. Really much nothing to hunt. Again, we've talked about it a few times. Nine pounds a day on the Great Plains for beef. They wish. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> They can barely pull anything. It gets to the point where they're going to start killing horses. Oh, wow. Already? Uh, they're already in for a couple of days. They're traveling up a mountainside. Like, they're burning right. a lot of calories and a lot of energy. Right. So, so they're about to just start axing the horses. Yeah. It's getting quite literally dire because now, obviously, when you're starting to kill the, the horses, the rations are out. It gets so dire, they resort to eating their candles. Oh, no. Gosh, I'm getting flashbacks of freaking Donner Party here. Yes, yes, it's real bleak. <laughs> it's not great, is it? In fact, that's even in my notes. They're in the same position of the Donner Party. They continue to march through the Buttermut Rottens very slowly, but on eventually, on September 18th, they start to see some open prairie and down a descent. But honestly, uh, they're probably more dead than alive. All men are there, uh, but it's been a pretty rough week and a half. So it did take them nine days. It took them, I believe, 10. Where did I say? The party leaves on September 10th. They're back on the 18th. So, yes. Oof. Two of those days. And keep in mind, they haven't found the nest perch yet. They're just descending the first range of the Bitterroot. <laughs> oh, no. So they just made the first clearing. Yes. But it is starting to look up because the horses also hadn't had anything to eat because it had been snowing. But now that there's prairie grass, at least they have something to graze. So if they do need to kill a little another horse, at least there's going to be some meat on them bones. But, yeah, it's not great. Even better news. Well, not even better news. It's pretty bleak news at this point, but they're out. They get better news because they run into the Nez Perce pretty quickly, actually. Yes. They meet with a chief named Twisted Hair, and he gives them some incredible news that they may only be mere weeks from the ocean. Oh, snap. That would perk me right up. Yeah, like spirits instantly get better. They're probably still side-eyeing old Toby because his name is Toby. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, obviously you're going to be in a better mood. The Columbia River is a tributary. Uh, a, no, sorry. A tributary of the Columbia River is only about five days away. Once they get to the Columbia River, keep in mind, I've said it a couple times. Once they're on the Continental Divide, the current is with them. Once you get on the Columbia, giddy up. It's time to go. Not only that, once they're on the Columbia... They're now going to be on the map again. People have explored the Columbia. In fact, a ship went up about 100 miles up the coast as far as it could about, you know, not probably 50 years in advance. I can't remember the exact date, but it, it had been explored. They knew what to expect out there. So I was going to ask, I was going to ask this. So, I mean, I, I know we talked about it where like ships went all the way down South America back up. So like, is there defined camps in like California and stuff? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of trading posts. There is, I'm trying to remember one story. 
So like once they make it that way, once they make it there, like they'll have enough to like restock and everything and like there will it's be not trading like, shit. Yes. So it's not like they're gonna like have to live off the land for weeks until another the next boat comes. No, it's not anywhere it I wouldn't say it's populated. It's more populated than the area they're coming out of. But it's not it's not a metropolis by any means. It's not like this big grand trading post. It's more you have to go hunt for your trading post. You'll run into some white people. You'll run into mainly Native Americans. And yes, occasionally you will find a trade ship. OK, and that's what they were hoping. They, that's what they were banking on. The trade ship. Yes. They're just trade run into one of those trade ships. Uh, to do two things. One, to replenish their stock. And remember, Lewis uh, still has open credit. From the president of the United States. So he can, he has an open checkbook. If right. the British, you know, choose to accept it and the French choose to accept it because the British are still a bit salty at this point. Right. <laughs> Only a few years removed. <laughs> I mean, just two generations away, but who's going to remember that? So anyway, they're not there yet. Twisted Hair gives the men some roots and some berries, but the starving men gorge themselves they gorge themselves so much they actually give themselves dysentery oh geez (laughs) like really bad dysentery lewis writes that some of them were compelled to lie down on the side of the road for some time they can't even move like we're swelled bellies it's not it it's painful is what it is so what do they prescribe lightning bolt they have thunderbolt, you dang thunderbolt. right they do. <laughs> yep. For dysentery. Basically, not a disease of the bowels, but you're going to give them a, a laxative for dysentery. Doesn't dysentery give you, like, the runs and everything? Sure it does. <laughs> Wait, I'm just doubling down on it now. Wait, so, you're, so you can't control your bowels? I got something for you. <laughs> If you thought you had no control before. <laughs> I can just see those guys just laying in a puddle of their own crap. Oh, like, I hope they're near a river, but it's real. They're in an incredibly weak state, arguably just as bad as when they came out of the mountains. With the expedition quite literally incapacitated, uh, this brings up a pretty unique opportunity for the Nez Perce. Stephen Ambrose writes, It would have been the work of only a few moments for the Nez Perce to kill the white men and take them for all the expeditions for all their goods. Had the Indians done so, they would have been in position in possession of by far the largest arsenal, not just west of the Rocky Mountains, but west of the Mississippi River, along with priceless kettles, axes, hatchets, beads, and other trade items and quantities greater than any other they had seen in their lifetimes. If they kill them, remember the Blackfeet are the power in the territory. Yeah. Uh, That could quickly change because the Americans have really good rifles. They have a lot of powder, they have a lot of lead, and they have some trade goods. So, the Nez Perce have a think a very serious thing. Obviously, the captains don't know what's going on or else they obviously would have left if they were able to. They meet and the decision is made. They are going to kill them. They are? They've decided. The chiefs, they've done their counsel. The decision has been made. Until a woman named Watkui speaks up. Wat Kuis had been taken captive by the Blackfeet years before and then traded to a white settler who treated her well. In fact, her name is translated to returned from a far country. Only because of Wat Kuis, the Nez Perce completely changed their mind. She literally saved the entire core of Discovery. Yes. It would have been over with the Nez Perce. So instead of killing them, they do the complete opposite. They welcome them with open arms. They start showing them how to make canoes, like how to make, make basically cut it open with a fire. So they build a fire, let it hollow it out, and then you could hollow that out and get it out quicker, right? 
they promised to help negotiate with other tribes. They would send warriors ahead to let them know not to let not to harm the explorers coming through. They were doing them a heck of a favor. And so to go good. from we're killing these guys to nobody touched these guys. They're untouchable. Yes. All because one white dude treated her well when she was contracted. What is that dude's name, man? He needs to be in the history books. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't think it's I don't think it could be <laughs> this uh, man single handedly saved an entire expedition party. It makes you think of all the butterfly effect of history and just imagine where where that goes. One dude treated someone like a human being and it saved the core of discovery years later it makes you think man wow <laughs> all you have to be is nice <laughs> yeah <laughs> weird that should almost be a t-shirt all you have to be is nice <laughs> I, I never i never thought about it all i have to be is a good person <laughs> people kind remember of, people remember kindness is contagious I think that's what we've learned. In October 1805, the expedition now enter and start rowing down the Columbia River. And if there was a sound of the men going down the Columbia River, it would... How do I want to say this? Hmm. Wee! <laughs> Wee! Wee! <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh not only are they they're probably one they're incredibly amazed can you imagine after struggling with a water route the entire length for you just to be able to sit there and it pushes you in the direction you go like you must have felt like a king i wonder how how, how many miles did they make a day do you know uh like 20 <laughs> okay uh, 20 or 30. Uh, actually, do I have that written down? Yes. No longer fighting. They would make up 20, 20 miles a day. Uh, however, the men are also getting really impatient. You know, like, you know, you, you're close to home when you have to go to the bathroom. Like, imagine that. But you're instead of having to go to the bathroom, you really want to see the Pacific Ocean really, really, really badly because that's quite literally your mission. And once you see the Pacific Ocean, uh, you can go home. They haven't been home in two years, essentially. And I'm sure some of these guys are like married and stuff. Uh, they're they're very young men, so not a lot of them are married. Actually, other than Charbonneau, I don't know if any of them are married. Charbonneau! Who, again, when we say Charbonneau's married, Charbonneau uh, basically has a slave in Sacagawea, if we're being completely honest. Right. He's not, I mean, he's 45, she was 15. I mean, come on. Yeah, 16, but yes, very teenager, mother, yes. By November 2nd, they're officially now in map territory again. They travel a couple more days, this time making 30 miles a day. On November 5th, they find out that there are white travel traders in the area. Now, the weather isn't all cooperative as it is constantly raining, but they really don't care. In fact, they're getting so reckless that they're going down rapids that they have no business going down. As in natives who will who see these men going down the river, uh, they jump ahead a couple of miles and they just wait by the banks of the river just to pick up their goods when the men obviously are going to drown. They're risking everything to get to the Pacific Ocean at this point. All the care in the world. Which, kind of frustrating, considering how careful they had been. <laughs> right. like, they've had two near-death experiences already. Never mind the countless uh, bears and then just the general hab like dangers of being in nature. I mean, shoot, they almost died twice in the last two months. Season, yeah. And the last season, they were really close to dying. So, like, why are we doing this? But nonetheless... Go, 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 go! It, it is a very human emotion, if we're being honest. It would be difficult not to. Oh, I mean, yeah, you start getting a little... Uh, you do start getting a little more, like, reckless toward the end because you want to just get there and be done. Yep. 
Yep. The kids are crying in the back seat. You just want. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? (laughs) This is where I think of Chris Farley telling kids in the back of the bus that he'll turn this bus around and ruin your precious field trip. (laughs) I will do that. (laughs) I will turn this entire expedition around. No, you won't. (laughs) It's through the clearing. Nope. I said, turn around. (laughs) Nope. So the weather still isn't cooperating uh, as far as on November 5th. But again, they see that there's white traders in the area. Two days later, William Clark writes in his journal, Ocean in view. Oh, the joy. They've made it. Kind of. They're actually, they're actually in an estuary, but... And they go about 30 miles. They realize they're about 30 miles actually short of the ocean. And they make that up in a day. Like they're they're not messing around anymore. They're continuing. But finally, on the next day, on April 8th, on November 8th, Clark writes again, great joy in camp as we are in view of the ocean, the great Pacific Ocean of which we are so long anxious to see. He then wrote ocean 4,142 miles from the mouth of the Missouri River. Can you imagine the absolute euphoria <laughs> of finally seeing this body of water? I imagine tears were shed. A lot of tears were shed <laughs> from a lot of very hardened men who just saw the most beautiful sight they had ever seen. Um. I was I was really going to try to hold on to this fact until his episode, but I just can't because it's just so cool. So, again, Clark is really the one that's been making this map like he's been the one basically off of dead reckoning using latitude and longitude and just going around that bend. That's about 800 yards away. OK, I'm going to map that down and then they go around the next bend. OK, that's about 600 yards away again. We're going to write that down. He does that all the way for his map. The 4,142 miles. That is insane. Do you want to know something more insane? He was almost spot on. He was off by 40 miles. No way. Oh, my God. For 4,000. That's what? What is that? 10%? No? Not even. Not even 10%. That's that's like percent. Yeah, it's like a percent. Yeah. It's a rounding error is what it is. Holy crap. He said he had a good eye. <laughs> you did, yes, the best eye. Like it's of all of the stats and all of the things of the core of discovery. That is the absolute coolest. Like the absolute best. Like that is top tier elite. Like the skill. On November 18th, Lewis would write his name on a tree, which Clark would later come over and write the words. By land. So now the message would read, Meriwether Lewis, by land, from the United States, 1804 and 1805. But with their greatest triumph comes frustration. For the next week, they are pinned down by rain and tides that is so strong and so hard that their clothes are literally rotting. Oh my god. It has been constantly raining since the Columbia River, (laughs) and they've been near water like it's uh, just imagine yourself being really, really wet all of the time. I would hate it. Yeah, I mean, it's even hard to keep fire going because all of the wood is just constantly wet. So imagine just that weird smoke like, you know going in uh it'd be, it it wouldn't be great now it's better than what it was up in the in the bitterroot mountains but it's still it's not pleasant to be there <laughs> on november 22nd the wind increased of the storm and clark feared as he wrote down in his journal quote the wind blew with such violence that i expect every moment to see the trees taken up by the roots somewhere oh how tremendous is this day and also, we're talking about the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there's some pretty big trees there. Now, these obviously aren't redwoods. They've seen a couple redwoods, but 
for trees to be uprooted there, that's some powerful wind. Outside of the terrible weapon, weather, the captains need to decide where they're going to spend the winter. They could decide to make their camp with a local tribe named the Klatsa. They could also, the, or they could cross the river and see if they could find a better site for camp. Or the third, they could camp on the south bank to get salt and have a better chance of finding a trade ship. Again, as you kind of pointed out, finding a trade ship would allow them to send back the journals that would likely beat beat them to Washington, where Jefferson would have his journals, or at least a copy of it. So again, this is where everyone likes to point out the captains are well within the right to just decide where to go, but they put it up to a vote. Everyone gets a vote on where they're going to stay, including Sacagawea and York, the slave. Everyone loves to point out at this point that it is the first time a woman and a black man would be allowed to vote as technically part of the United States. Now, I'll be honest. I think this is overblown. <laughs> but everyone likes to just talk about how pure of an American moment this is. And you know what? It's it's nice. I, I don't think it's the moment everyone builds it up to be, though. Because, <laughs> yes, York did vote. Sacagawea did vote. Women's suffrage is a century away. York's uh, people are still going to be slaves for the next 70 years, and they're not going to gain their civil rights for another 150. So it's nice. They decide to go on the South Bank where they're going to uh, wait for a trade ship, make salt, and that's where they're going to stay. So, sorry, everyone. I just killed that moment for you. I just think it tends to be overblown. <laughs> oh, wow. Way to be a Debbie Downer, Eric. Jeez. Sorry. A, there's so much to celebrate on the core of, ex, on the core of Discovery, but... Sorry, this everyone listening. Eric just likes to rain on the parade. <laughs> yes. Well, it's quite literally raining on them, so why don't I just do the same for you? It's basically how they felt. It's a pretty uneventful winter. Uh, the problem is they don't really see a trade ship, though. So that's troublesome. So they don't even have the option to send back the journal. So they have to take everything back. Outside of that, no trade ship. That also brings up another problem. They just crossed a continent trading goods with natives. Um, th they don't have anything left to trade anymore. So back how the heck are they getting back? <laughs> That's a good question because there's a lot of tolls that may need to be paid. You have the Nez Purse on your side, but remember the, the Teton Sioux? They weren't impressed the first time you went to, around to them. They're probably going to expect a little bit more this time, along with every tribe's going to expect more this time. Lewis described what they had could fit into two handkerchiefs. Oh, my. So they brought how many canoes and pierogies, was it? Pro pierogies. pierogies. Yeah, they're pierogies now. That's a visual I'm never going to get out of my head. <laughs> pierogies, but yes. Pierogies, yes. Pierogies. Full of stuff, tons of stuff. And now <laughs> two handkerchiefs. To be fair, but they did it. Now, a reasonable assumption is you would have found a, a, a trade ship. That is a reasonable assumption to make once you got to the Pacific Ocean. It was just tough luck that they didn't. So really, kudos for them to planning that out. So you only had two handkerchiefs left when you get to the Pacific Ocean. But it's a real downer now. <laughs> you, there's it's, it's rough going. This is where the expedition also kind of... I won't say take a term, but they become a lot more impatient. So they've been dealing with, with tribes for the last two years, essentially. They found them irksome, especially the trading uh, the, with tradings that they thought that was they were charging too high a tolls or they would just steal their horses. Well, now just put some homesickness into that feeling and you just kind of dial that notch up just two or three clicks. The Klats up steal some of the few items they have left. And they start to view the, the natives much more of annoyance, as I just said. 
As the situation becomes more bleak, the expedition starts breaking its own moral code, and for the first time, Lewis stole a canoe rather than just pay for it. Lewis, you animal. Lewis did it. As the winter turns to spring, again, the very homesick expedition leave in March 1806. While they will be going against the current for the Columbia River for the time being, they now had a map on exactly how to get home. And they couldn't get home fast enough. In particular, Lewis has lost all patience. When one native stole his Newfoundland dog, Newfoundland dog, Seaman. (gasps) Not Seaman. Well, he gave an order that, quote, if they made the least resistance or difficulty in surrendering the dog, he would fire on them. So basically, you give me my dog back or some of you are dying. I am going to kill you. Yes. The soldiers set out. But when the thieves realize that they're being pursued, they they let Seaman go. Yay, Lewis got him back. Yep. When they get back to the camp after recovering Seaman, the natives then stole an axe. Uh. And after that happens, Lewis gives an order that, quote, they made any further attempts to steal our property or insult our men that we should be put them to instant death. He is done. He is done. Now, this, when you, this is one of, again, there's only a couple instances you can count to Lewis's depression. Erratic behavior and this type of, like, flare-up is, definitely can be attributed to depression. It doesn't make it better. Like, we're not excusing it. But it is a signal. Now, it could also just be a signal that he really wanted to get home, which is a very human emotion, but to quite literally kill over He's an very act, irritable. Yes, as long are the other men, but I don't think they're willing to murder over an axe at this point. As they're traveling up the Columbia River, they meet back with the Nez Perce pretty quickly. But then the Nez Perce tell them that the mountain snow hadn't run off yet and they wouldn't be able to cross for three weeks. Oh my God, just with any <laughs> man wanting to go home, this uh, he loves to hear. Yeah, it's great. Uh, Lewis writes in his journal that he believes it's a bad idea, but, quote, this information is disagreeable. It causes me some doubt as to time in which it must it was in which it will be the most proper for us to set out. As we have no time to lose, we will risk the chances and set out as early as possible, as the Indians generally think it is practicable for the middle of the month. So they're going to wait, but just barely. They wait the three weeks, and the mountains still haven't run off in it, and the Nez Perce are still telling them, you probably shouldn't go up there yet, but they push on anyway. And then they have to return, because it is too deep. Uh... So they have to wait for a couple more weeks. But they decide, well, if we're going to have to wait these couple weeks we may as well try to explore a little bit more territory when we're able to travel because we don't know how many money delays we may as well just you know you know for instance that shortcut that should have taken us four days let's go explore that right Uh, so they're going to decide to split up the camp and really for a significant amount of the trip back lewis is going to travel a thousand miles uh, I believe up the northern route, and then Lewis is going to take a route southern that's going to go about Clark. 800 miles. No, Lewis is going 800, and then Clark is going 1,000. So, sorry. I believe Lewis, I believe Clark goes north and uh, Lewis goes south. But regardless, they're splitting up for about five or six weeks as they descend uh, back onto the back into the, uh, the Rockies and then down. On July 4th, 1806 is when they officially split. Now, the journey back, they've made friends. They kind of know who they should deal with. But again, and we've talked about, we've tiptoed around the Blackfeet enough to where the Blackfeet are very aware that the expedition is there. Now, if you're the Blackfeet and you are the power in the area, you are not thrilled that the expedition is here. Because when you think of it, If you're the power, if you're the bully, the last thing you want is someone coming in and promising trade goods to those you're bullying. Right. So they're kind of looking for the core discovery. Now they're splitting apart. So we're going to follow Lewis because he's the one that's actually going to go into the territory. Clark kind of just goes around them. 
But Lewis kind of goes in the heart of it. And he kind of wants that because if he can meet with the Blackfeet and kind of do the same, you know, peace medal ceremony and talk with them, he can also bring them into the fold. Hip, hip, hooray. That's great. But in a expedition that is already divided, Lewis divides them again. (laughs) So now it's basically a small party of a half dozen men each, essentially a dozen men each, uh, going into this territory, this quite hostile territory. As they're passing, one day they see eight natives on a ridge staring at them. And it's very clear that they were tracking them before. Obviously, this uneases Lewis and George Druyard and uh, I believe the Field Brothers are there too. I can't remember uh, who else was all there. But Lewis does meet with them. They decide to camp with each other for the night. And everything, there's, there's some awkward, uneasy tension. But it, it's fine. You were kind of expecting this if you were Lewis. But then Lewis goes to sleep and he wakes up to a quote, damn you, let go of my gun from George Druyard. One of the Blackfeet had tried to take Druyard's gun while they were sleeping. The Field Brothers then chase down the warrior who starts to flee. And when the brothers turn to the other sides, they notice that the Blackfeet are going to go after their horses. So it's almost like a bait and switch. They go for the gun. They chase the warrior that goes for the gun. They go after him. And then the Blackfeet are coming around to take their horses. Lewis calls out to shoot any of them who are stealing the horses. And they chase is on for about 300 yards. Lewis is yelling that he will shoot if they don't return the horses. He is out of breath, but has no option but to lower his rifle and shoot. Uh, Did he kill him? He did. He shoots him in the gut and he kills him. The warriors return fire and Lewis would say, quote, I felt the wind of the bullets very distinctly. He then gave an order to George Druyard and the brothers to head back as they decide to have that they have to retreat, deciding that they weren't going to get their horses back, but instead They have to steal nearby Blackfeet horses from a herd. And now they decide that it's time to get out of here. We can't continue to talk because we just killed one of them. Before they do, though, on this nice little touch, they leave the peace medals on the body around the neck of one of the warriors. So they were aware of who they knew who did it. (laughs) Nothing says peace like a calling card. (laughs) Now, when you think of it, what were Lewis's or what was Jefferson's instructions way back in episode one? Don't kill anybody. Uh, Don't kill anyone. Oh, yes. But you have to maintain friendly relations with essentially all of the tribes. And you basically just declared war on the Blackfeet. Right. Like that could have generations. Serious repercussions. Yes. But it happened. Not much they can do about it now other than just run. They speed through Blackfeet territory until they finally meet up with Clark. And the Corps of Discovery reunites in the Missouri River in western North Dakota near the mouth of the Knife River. On August 14th, they return to the Mandan villages. This is where they depart from Sacagawea and Charbonneau, who Charbonneau gets paid $500 for his horse, a teepee, and then his services. John Coulter of the expedition is also given permission to leave, and he ends up uh, just heading back out west. So Coulter isn't coming back. Damn. Damn. In which, do I tell the story now or do I tell it later? May as well just tell it now. John Coulter. He's going to go on for a couple more years in the West. Uh, I can't remember what, maybe it was the Blackfeet, but he ends up getting ambushed by a tribe and he literally is wandering for a hundred miles. And then he describes kind of in his uh, 
we'll say stupor, that he stumbles upon a land where steam shoots up from the ground, like all, like everywhere. And when he's telling the story back, everyone thinks he's a loon. In fact, that's, they, uh, yeah. Um, what's the park? Uh, is it Yosemite? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yeah. Yellowstone. Yellowstone. <laughs> uh, but they called it Coulter's Hell to mock him. But yes, he stumbled upon Yellowstone. Oh, that's a way better name than Yellowstone. Hey, mom, dad, can we go visit Coulter's Hell? Hell. <laughs> Is that how that song goes? <laughs> what song? <laughs> whenever the horror, fu- like whatever, what's the terror movie? And like whenever you see Dracula, it's a do 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 do. Is that not? I feel like Dude, you're, you're, you're you're butchering it. You're making it sound like it's some happy. I'd be like something. It's a very famous organ sound. Phantom of the Opera, maybe? Oh, are you talking like dun 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 dun? No, 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 that's Beethoven, I think. I think that's Beethoven. No. You you know this sound. Type in Dracula sound. No, that's not it. But this is it's similar. This is Phantom of the Opera, but That's from the movie. In sleep he sang to me. In dreams he came. That voice that calls to me and speaks my name. No, screw it. Can't find it. It's fine. Doesn't matter. Okay, so whatever that song is, it doesn't matter at this point. It's Coulter's Hell. It's now Yellowstone. It's a cute little story, isn't it? We just spent, what, five minutes trying to find a song and we don't care? (laughs) Right. (laughs) I like I like your impression. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> so after they leave the Bandans, they're now back on the Missouri River. But this time, they like the Missouri River. Because they're going with the current, baby. Just guess how far they get a day. Just on some, now granted, they're going real, real fast. Like they're 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 busting. That's paddling. I'm going to say uh, 50 miles. Uh, sometimes 50, sometimes 80. Oh, my. They are cruising. <laughs> if they still have those long, like the wrong pointed sticks from the keel boat, they are curving into that. No wonder the no wonder 12 men were able to go back because they had the they had the current their whole way. Yes. <laughs> Because when you said it at first, I was thinking, man, that sucks for those guys. But I mean, they were just. Well, yeah. And also, like, they're in, they don't have the keel boat anymore. They're called, they're traveling in smaller vessels. So, like, did the keel boat go 80 miles an hour? No, because I think that thing would just break. Right. I don't think you want that thing going, you know, anything farther than, you know, 10 miles an hour or something like that. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're booking. Once more, as they start getting closer to the United States, they start seeing more trading boats heading the way up. It doesn't take America long to go up the Missouri River after Lewis and Clark. Like two years after. They're not even back yet. Yeah. Here's a map. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, hey, if you if you could hustle, you could sell that map for quite a bit. Copies of it. He's just sitting. Clark's just sitting there all day tracing. (laughs) Tracing. (laughs) There's like a bunch of tear marks where like. This is if you this if you could just save yourself forty nine days if you would just take the short cut. <laughs> no bitterness there. Uh, they pass uh, Floyd's Bluff. They pay their respects to Charles Floyd's for a bit. Uh, around this time, they also hear news from Washington, including Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, he's dead now. He was killed in a duel by Burr. By Burr. <laughs> So that was nice for Lewis to hear. Remember, Lewis dined with with Jefferson for two years in the White House. He was very much involved in a lot of like the political like he would have known of all of these. He would have known Hamilton didn't like and all of that good stuff. But now Hamilton's dead. Like imagine coming back into that.
They travel a little bit farther. And do you know how they know that they're getting close to home? They start seeing stuff. I mean, well, they've seen a lot of things, haven't they? But now let's, let's, let's continue your point. They have seen huge amounts of Buffalo. They've seen elk. They've seen grizzly bears. They've seen prairie dogs. But probably the loudest cheer on the expedition is Boats. when they see a cow. <laughs> yeah. Well, they probably haven't. Had, they probably haven't eaten cow in two I mean, exactly. years. They haven't had beef. They haven't had cow beef in a while, and they know a cow. Oh, we've made it, baby. They've done it. Oh man, that had to have been the best feeling in the world coming home <laughs> after a long trip. Do you think that that cheer went to the cow's head and he like started wearing sunglasses and felt they like cool? me? They really like boom. <laughs> Hamburgers on me, boys. <laughs> <laughs> the cow didn't stand a chance. <laughs> oh, and finally, on September 23rd, 1806, the day William Clark's episode will drop. They finally pull in to St. Louis, Missouri, and they're greeted as heroes by a thousand, uh, a thousand citizens. They had done it. They did it. Woo! They, they did it. Remember when you said eight people would die? Yeah. Zero people died. Just one from an appendix. Dang, man. They would have had everybody. Stupid appendix. Why you have to burst? <laughs> I mean, the appendix is just a useless organ. I don't even understand why we have it. They take a deep breath. The first thing Lewis does when they get to St. Louis, he writes a letter to Jefferson and he says, quote, and obedience to your orders. We have penetrated the continent of the North America of the Pacific Ocean and sufficiently explored the interior of the country to affirm with confidence that we have discovered the most practical practicable route that does exist across the continents by means of navigation branches of the Missouri and Columbia rivers. Sir. Yes, sir. Mission accomplished. Also the Northwest pass just doesn't exist because I didn't mention that, but maybe you're going to ignore that, but we did it. We did it. President Jefferson, please don't actually ask about the Northwest pass. <laughs> What about this Northwestern Passage you speak? Yeah, look at the Columbia River, the Missouri River and the Columbia. They're great. You just go right across here. This doesn't exist, sir. Please don't yell at me. <laughs> so now Lewis has a plan that he's going to have to write these journals because uh, there, there's a lot, lot to organize there. There's going to be three different novels. The, the third novel is specifically going to be the scientific branch of it. So really, the first two are going to be like maps and narrative and all of that good stuff. He also believes he is going to become immeasurably rich, rich after the journals are published. Even though the journals technically didn't belong to Lewis or Clark. This is government property. They were paid by the public. The Jefferson basically owned them, but that's that problem. That problem can solve its fault. We'll figure that out later. It will be fine. Lewis also tries to fight because uh, remember William Clark still officially a lieutenant, right? Crap. So, um, has to deal with that. But the other men do get paid, and they do get their rewards. They get some land. They get a nice chunk of change, and some of them just mainly go off in the distance. Some return out West. Uh, Patrick gas lives, I believe until like 99. Uh, yeah, he, li he gets photographed. Uh, I believe he out survives the civil war. Jeez. He, dies, he dies in the 1870s. If I remember that right. Yeah. The rest of them just kind of disappear. Live, Jeff Cold live the rest of their lives. Yeah. So finally in December, that year, Lewis returns to Washington, D.C., and he meets with Jefferson on January 1st, 1807. Now, for whatever reason, neither man wrote down what they did in the meeting. But what is known is that both of them got on their hands and knees and looked at Clark's map. <laughs> oh, just take a look down here. 
<laughs> you know what I instantly think of is you remember those old uh like when you're when you go to like a preschool or something like that and they have that rug with like the streets on it and the cars and all of that. Oh yeah. Kind of just like that, but two grown men just like going through every bit of the the journey and then this is reporting back and like can you imagine like jefferson's face is just like exploding with excitement like it it just it's a generally wholesome moment of like lewis probably going into a lot of detail and the mandans are here and then the rocky mountains and there's no northwest passage but then we get to the columbia river and then we can get to here but yeah sorry sir it doesn't exist i don't know i don't know what to tell you (laughs) but yeah just Genuinely, genuinely a nice moment. Lewis is given the territorial governorship of Louisiana for his reward in running the expedition and returning it safely. But as far as Jefferson's concerned, he would really like those journals published like tomorrow. Please only work on this if you get this done. But actually, here's this incredibly hard, complex job for you to deal with while you're doing that. Lewis works with a publisher initially and comes up with closing costs, but he doesn't hire an editor for the first six months after he returns. In fact, despite constant promises, he never actually starts organizing the journals, despite other members of the expedition, i.e. Patrick Gass. Gass is already going to publish his own journals well in advance before Lewis gets his done. Oh, wow. Much to the annoyance of Lewis. Because remember, Lewis is thinking he's going to get publishing rights. He's going to make a lot of money off these. And Gas basically just got ahead of that market. But anyway, he does have a fancy new job. And he reports for the governorship in February 1808. Lewis is blindsided by a St. Louis who is in kind of in a neighbor and a labor negotiation Uh, between fur traders and their employees. Apparently, the fur traders don't want to pay too many employees. So that's going on in the background. And also, Lewis doesn't quite realize just how political St. Louis is. Now, it's a growing town. It's a budding town. But Lewis doesn't come across as the type of guy who's really politically savvy. While on the job... Lewis does approve the building of forts on the Missouri River, but then he forbids the Sioux from trading at them. You remember the Tetons? Yep, he was holding the grudge. He didn't forget, which, if you're trying to keep peace in the area, maybe you should be bringing the Tetons in. Like, maybe this is a genuine compromise moment. Right. Hey, remember how awful you were to us? I'm going to forget that. (laughs) Yes. Uh, so instead, uh, he focuses on, so he, do, he doesn't deal with the, the Teton Sioux, but he also focuses on just kicking the British out. He would just like them to leave the area, please. Now doing that would be incredibly expensive and obviously would need to go through Congress. So that doesn't really go anywhere, but you just get the fe- this feeling that Lewis doesn't quite know what to do in the position. And in fact, this is where you can really start to see his depression really take off. He struggles to find anyone to marry him. What frustrates him a little bit is that Clark gets married soon after he returns from the expedition. But Lewis is trying really, really hard. And after being rejected, he would wrote, he would write quote, I am a perfect widower with respect to love. I feel that all restlessness and ineptitude, that certain indescribable something common to old bachelors, which I cannot avoid thinking, my dear fellow, proceeds in that void in our heart, which might or ought to be filled. Once it comes out, I do not, but I am certain that I have never felt less than a hero than I am at this present moment. What may be my next adventure, God knows, but I know I am determined to get a wife. For his friends who are married, he writes a letter letter to Major William Preston, and is just angry because Preston is is married. Now, there's there's more to this letter, but in it, Lewis writes, quote, How wretchedly you married men arrange your subjects of which you meet 
in which I have gained that which I have yet to obtain, a wife. Like, you can just see he's so focused on why isn't anybody, like, why am I not able to do this one thing? It just, it floods his mind is what, it, what you have to kind of feel for him. With the pressures of his job, Lewis starts to drink more. Just like in the expedition, there would also be long stretches of no writing from him. And for a friend, as in Jefferson, who was waiting for his manuscripts, it is becoming so frustrating for Jefferson because he just wants these manuscripts for these for these journals, but Lewis just isn't doing them. By the time it gets to the fall 1809, Lewis hasn't written anything. This is now two years after the expedition. He hasn't even two, started. Years. He really hasn't started. Oh, no. When the world really starts following in on Lewis, there was a man named Bates who likely wanted Lewis's position as the governor and is willing to throw as much shade Lewis's way as he possible. And in fact, he really starts barking up that there's some discrepancies in the books from the expedition to the tune of $38,000. That money isn't going to get reimbursed until those discrepancies go away. As Jefferson leaves office, the Madison administration doesn't necessarily care about the core of discovery nearly as much as Jefferson does. So it's looking like Lewis might be stuck with this $38,000. Like that he has to pay? That he might have to pay from these IOUs. That line of credit Jefferson gave him might just be his now. Oh, my God. With this looming in the air, both Lewis and Clark decide that they need to go to Washington to help settle this dispute and then probably just confront Bates to see what's really going on. Lewis leaves St. Louis, but he, before he does, he writes out his last will. Hey, everyone. It's Matt here. Sorry for the interruption. Eric and I wanted to give a listener discretion warning for the rest of the episode. You know, as we discussed in parts one and two of Lewis, he did suffer from depression and unfortunately he will take his own life. While we will leave out the details of his death, we will be talking about the circumstances and buildup around it during the last part of this episode. Eric and I want to stress mental health is very important. Please take care of yourselves. If you or anyone you know is experiencing any thoughts of harming yourself or others, please call or text the national hotline at 988. If you live overseas or are one of our international listeners, please reach out to whomever you love or your national hotline. Thank you, and now we will return to the rest of the episode. Please take care of yourselves. On September 3rd, 1809, Lewis is carrying the journals with him for delivery to Washington. He might actually look like he might be delivering them to a publisher, even though there's really not much that, like there's not much written in them, if anything. Again, he's going to intend to travel to Washington from a ship that's coming up from New Orleans. As he's floating down the Mississippi River, it's not much known what was happening, but Lewis attempts to kill himself. Don't really know what happened, but what is known that he needs to be restrained and he's put on a watch for the next 24 hours and they won't even give him access to gunpowder anymore. Now, he's still heavily drinking, but he appears to at least get better, at least to those surrounding him, that that episode is now done. They continue on and Lewis travels for the next 100 miles, again, drinking heavily. On October 9th, he arrives at a place called Grinders Inn, about 72 miles south of Nashville. It is a very small wooden cabin that takes overnight bookings. Mrs. Grinder is alone as her husband is away. After asking to spend the night, Lewis then spends most of the day pacing back and forth in front of the cabin, when Mrs. Grinder said, quote, Something 
he would seem as if he was walking up to her, and then suddenly he would wheel around and walk back as fast as he could. You can tell something is clearly on his mind. Likely, he is trying to come up with whatever argument he's going to have to present in Washington. This behavior continued throughout the night, but for a brief time, Lewis sat on a porch, uh, smoked a pipe, and just looked west. He said to Mrs. Grinder, Madam, this is a very pleasant evening. And honestly, there's there's a there's a lot more detail um, that we're not going to get into. But um, later that night, Lewis takes his own life. Um, it is just three years after the expedition, and he is only thirty five years old. It's a real hard ending. I told Matt at the start uh, at the start of the first episode that um, I don't get emotional during like with history a whole lot. Um, Lewis's death hits really hard, and I think it hits hard for a lot of people. For someone who had accomplished so much, it just seems like he couldn't get over just stumbling blocks at the end. Like, it just seems like his whole world collapsed around himself. It's almost like when you go on a big adventure and you think you're doing something great, you come back and realize that, you know, you had all these ideas about when you return and it's almost as if when you get back, no one seems to care that much. And then you start getting into the whole, well... Where is this money coming from? What are you going to do to pay it back? Right. And that kind of stuff. So obviously he didn't make it back to Washington and meet up with Clark to try and dispute this money issue. No. What a very tragic ending to a great life. A full life. I mean, I know he didn't think he had a full life, but for 35 years old, he accomplished a lot. Like I'm 33 and I feel fairly accomplished, and I'm, I didn't take uh, men into an area that had never been discovered before. For two but, years. Yeah. And again, one death right? that there was nothing they could do about. Well, I mean, even if they were in a big city or at in St. Louis when it happened, nothing could have been done, right? No. I mean, they didn't really no. do, like, appendix stuff. Nope. Back then, the best doctor, the best doctor in the world, would not have been able to save Floyd. Mm-hmm. It was just something that freakly happened. Yep, it just happened. Yeah. So now we will move on to the ratings. Okay, first round. Are you satisfied? This is our biography round where we'll be handing out negative ten points to positive ten points, depending on how well we like the story. Matt, I know what score I want to give. So, sometimes you need three episodes to explain a great story. And this, my friend, is probably the best story I think we've gone through. I'm going with max points here. I'm giving him the 10. I think he was... I think that journey was insane. Yes. I can't imagine thinking of my, like someone coming up to me being like, do you want to go into uncharted territory and me going, yep, let's do it. <laughs> like, no, the, all those people were crazy. I mean, yeah. of course they were all promised like land and this and that and money, blah, 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 blah. You don't know if you're coming back. You don't know what you're going to see. I mean, they saw grizzlies, they saw hostile natives, they saw, you know, harsh land, they saw the weather changing, they They were stuck, they moved slow, they were bleed, their feet bled. Yeah. Like, terrible. But good God, they did it for America. Yep. (laughs) They did it. And the fact that Clark only got within 40 miles, crazy. That map must have been looked awesome. I would have loved to have seen that map, too. 
I'd have been on my hands and knees right with uh, Lewis and Jefferson. Yeah, I, I, so I go on a lot of walks, right? Mm-hmm. And back in back when I lived in South Dakota, there was a there was a certain strip in Brookings, South Dakota, near. I mean, this doesn't matter to anyone, but near the softball fields, there was an open field, and I always could just picture like this wide open prairie, long grass, and I almost kind of picture. Uh, this is probably a lot of what they saw. Like, this is kind of the terrain. And I would just walk over that, and I just think that was the coolest thing. Um, I I love the story so, so much. Probably because it is, like, it is everything you pretend when you're, like, six years old in your backyard. It is that story. You're going out to a place you've never been before, and you're going to accomplish danger and you're going to be great. And it just, it is such, such a great story. I love it so much. I'm giving it a 10, but we, we all knew I was giving it a 10, didn't we? Oh, of course. <laughs> 20 for Are You Satisfied? Next round, be sure you are right, then go ahead. This is our morality round where we'll be handing out negative 10 points apiece to positive 10 points apiece, depending on how good we thought Meriwether Lewis was. He was great, right? I mean, giving them, I mean, he could have been a terrible, terrible captain. And he could have forced his men to just, but you even said so yourself, he was beloved. I mean, yeah. hey, we're doing this. I don't care what you guys say. No. Hey, let's take it for a vote. The fact that he let Clark be his equal, even when they both knew he wasn't, speaks high. Like, that guy has yeah. a good character. Now, I mean, did he get a little irritable? Of course. You try going away for two years. Sleeping on crap, not showering. I mean, your clothes are rotting off of you. Listen, I've been to a ball game where I got that drenched before where you just sit out in the rain and it is miserable. You're from head to toe. All you feel is wet and you're like so aggravated. You just stand there and let the rain pelt you. It's awful. So I can't imagine for days. Of course, you're going to get irritable. But overall, that dude was mucho gusto. What I will say, he is unbelievably good on the expedition to the point you forget he was a slave owner. Right. That's real hard. No, we never really talked about it. But was the slave they brought his? No, it's Clark's. Okay. That's for his episode. And that isn't nearly the case. Okay, Uh, we'll get there. Yes, we will. So overall, I'm going to give him a solid eight and a half. 8.5. I think that's about right. I'm trying to think. So Slay, I'm like I said, it's he's so good. You forget he was a slave owner. Uh, trying to just pick out other moments. I mean, if you're looking for the pure bad, because I feel like that's what we need to do. Because my in, my impulse is like, he's much closer to a 10 than a 0. And he's not negative. But, so I have to figure out where I'm taking points away. Obviously, slave owner, taking the points away. The killing basically threatening to burn down a village for essentially your dog (laughs) that's not great now how much of that was his depression how much of that we need to factor into it i don't know it that depression i think affected him much more than what the journey implies like you really have to scope out that depression in order to to find it until the very end to where it's almost like Lewis is kind of running around rudderless. Like the expedition is done that he just doesn't know what direction to go in in life. So I think I'm going to go slightly lower and I'm, I'm going to go with an eight, but I think it's, it's pretty good. Pretty good. 16.5 next round. 
to hell with the consequences. This is our crazy or clever round. We're going to be handing out negative 10 points apiece to positive 10 points apiece, depending on if we think he's crazy or if he's clever. Does designing a boat, is that clever? It's meticulous. <laughs> you could say it's a bit crazy because he really liked the detail. I really don't know if he was clever. What did he do that was clever? He went to the Pacific Ocean on uncharted territory with four do- with three dozen men and only one of them died. All right. Okay. So what did he do <laughs> that was clever? He gave birth. He, no, sorry. He didn't give birth. Uh, he gave birth to Sacagawea's uh Yeah, and son. then he almost poisoned people with arsenic. Yeah, but okay. That's... Yes, that did, and that was himself, by the way. Um, when Sacagawea became sick, he nursed her back to health. Because remember, Clark was just bleeding her, <laughs> like, to death. You're, you're peeing out your butthole? I got something for you. Thunderbolt. What I will say, so when they have dysentery, giving them a laxative, not the best move, is it? <laughs> Probably the worst possible move you can give them. But I understand, like, you can't be dumb to go that far right like you have to be really really smart now is smart and clever the same thing mm, that could that can be a debate but um you could say the crazy part they were getting pretty reckless as they were getting closer to the pacific ocean and then when they were getting home right uh i would say clever points when they're meeting with the teton sioux they didn't break out into a fight when it very well looked like it was going to be a fight. Sirens on our end. That was the Tetons. They're coming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, I'm going to, you might think it's low. I'm going to do five and a half. I think it's criminal. What do you think? It's not criminal. I, not that one single accomplishment, I think gives you a high score. But if you don't get a high score for that, I don't know what we're judging on anymore. So I'm going another eight. Oh, wow. Okay. Because he had, keep on, scientific discovery, like hundreds, hundreds of discoveries between writing down language samples, writing down, uh, I guess they hunted a prairie dog for an afternoon. That's a bit weird. But. I can't remember. Was it James Rhonda? Who was it? Dayton? I can't remember who it was. But somebody said Lewis and Clark weren't only the first. They were the best. And I can't stress that enough. Now, if Lewis would have been able to publish the journals, it would have been different. Because honestly, after Lewis dies, those journals just kind of sit there for all. They get published. But in fact, it takes like 90 years for the Lewis and Clark expedition to really like start growing in popularity again. Damn. Like you have you have people like um I love you, John Quincy Adams, but John Quincy Adams thought the core of discovery was the biggest waste of money of all time. <laughs> His attitude was based I mean, granted, keep in mind John Quincy Adams was the son of John Adams and Jefferson and John Adams did not get along there for the longest time. So maybe there was some interior motives, but yeah, there and but John Quincy Adams was not the only one that thought that way. The the definition of the core discovery was some people were like, yeah, you did it. So what, what was the whole purpose? What did we gain? In which case those people are wrong. They're dumb. But anyway, eight next round. Oh, sorry. Total score for to hell with the consequences. Uh, 13.5. And with that, we're going to lock his score because he is right now at positive. He is at positive 50 points. If he had been negative 50, we would continue to subtract points from here on out. But because he's positive, we're going to continue to add points. Next round is draw. If we were in a duel with Meriwether Lewis, how screwed are we from zero to 10? <sighs> zero? I don't. Yeah, I'm really not. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say. I, okay, so here's the deal. It's not that type of story. So I don't even want to really give any points on that because I just don't know enough to even know what to give him. 
I mean, you do know he's a good shot because right. But I mean, he yeah. never was in those situations. He wasn't that type of person to be in. Right. The fight with the Blackfeet. He was the type that he probably wasn't going to back down if he knew he was going to get in a fight. But yeah, there's really not much to go on. This just isn't his round. I'm going to give him two because I think he's a good shot, but he's not the fighting type. Uh, I guess change my deal. One. One. Okay. Three. Three points. Next round. Legacy. How well known is he from zero to ten? Come on. Come on. Come mm-hmm. on. Come mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come on. Say it. Say it. Say it. Make my day. Say it. Four. Oh, you mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. Podcast is over, everyone. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Obviously, there's no way he can't get max points for this. It's Lewis and Clark. Like, if Clark doesn't get 10 on this, I mean, spoiler alert, he's going to get a 10 too because this is like huge. This was a huge deal. What do you give it, Eric? <laughs> 10 with a bullet. Uh, do you remember when you when we were listing off, well, who do we have left for big names that isn't George Custer? Who is go? Why did I give him a nine and a half? Because I knew these two were coming up. And I will I will fight anyone that thinks George Custer is more famous than Meriwether Lewis or George or uh, or William Clark. I will fight you. It is Americana at its absolute best. And you know what I really love about it? For the most part, the story is just a pure, good story. There's really no ugly backstabbing. Most of the encounters with the Native Americans are good. They're great stories. We're going to ignore most of the other history because Av, you can really look at this point for Native tribes that it's really downhill from there. But you know what? That's for another story and another day that we've already covered. It's a 10. It's a, always been a 10. It will forever be a 10. Fight me if you disagree. So, yeah, I'm going with a 10. Max points. 20. 20 for Legacy. Uh, next round. You know what? We're just going to skip it because it's death bonus. We're not going there. You killed. Uh, next round. Counting coup. Confirmed dish kills. Uh, divided by 10. Zero? Did he even kill One. anybody? Blackfeet near the end. Oh, yep. You're right. Yep. Yep. So point. He One. scared away a bear. He was in wastewater deep and he scared away a bear. Right. That's not really doing it. So uh, one. Point one. He He has done it. So that means his final score, 73.1. Nice. Which, which I believe, I believe that's the high. I think he's done it. Billy the Kid, 70.1. Tecumseh, 70. Sitting Bull, 71. So, Meriwether Lewis. Now the high score, 73.1 points, and with a really bad draw score. (laughs) Right. Which really tells you how much that's how great that story was and how well known he is because we're not intimidated at all, and he's still the high score. So now we move on to the drafting phase. Eric, did you bring your trusty coin with you? I didn't. Oh, no. no. I'm still in Albany. Oh, no. We need a real coin. Crap. I have one, but I, I feel dirty about it. So while Eric grabs that coin, so while Eric grabs that coin, as you know, him and I are drafting a team of 20 figures each. The rest of the figures will go into the free agent pool, which we can add and drop figures as we please up until that final tournament. Each team like I said, consists of 20 people. Uh, Whoever wins the coin toss will decide if they want that person on their team or not. If they pass, then the other person has the opportunity to pick them up or send them to the free agent pool. So now, Eric, do you have the coin? Okay. He doesn't have his typical quarter, ladies, or his typical coin, so we have to use a crappy regular quarter. So, Eric, go ahead and flip it. Washington. 
I want to win so badly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, you, you don't know how badly I want to win this. How do I cheat? I haven't looked at the card. How do I cheat? <laughs> it is Washington. No, is it? Tails? No, it's not. I know. Yes. It's yes. <laughs> yes. So by that, you can say Eric will be drafting Mr. Merriweather Lewis. You know, up until Custer, I thought I had the best team and it was hands down. I thought I was so confident. And then you got Custer and then you got Sitting Bull. And then I looked at my team and went, oh, dear. Because <laughs> those those are real big names that I don't think I'm going to overcome. So this was this was a do or die flip for me because I needed a big name with a good story. And you know what? We still have some big, Lewis, bigger names. We, ah, well, we just gave them a 20, so I don't know about bigger names, but oh, that's big. That's that's one big win for the good guys is what that is. <laughs> so with that, we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to this three-part adventure. Now, we will also be covering Sacagawea and Clark at your normally scheduled intervals. I do think so. Sacagawea, there will be some rehashing. I did leave out some details so we can talk about her specifically. Uh, a lot of it's probably going to be just be, not probably a lot of it's going to be between her relationship with uh, Charbonneau and her. Um, so just so if you if you're inclined to think what else can we cover, there is there is other things to cover for her. And then Clark. Believe it or not, on an ep- on something we just spent three episodes on, uh, the expedition is only a small part of William Clark's life, so we probably won't even touch on the expedition all that much, even though his episode drops on the anniversary of when they return. So there's there's a lot more to cover. We're not done with them yet, but I'm I'm going to be sad to see Lewis go. I'm happy he's on my team, but I really enjoyed these. I hope other people enjoyed it too, but this was, I think, my favorite set of episodes to record. It was great. Remember, if you like what you heard today, go ahead and like and subscribe. Leave us a comment on whatever podcast service you are listening on. Uh, We really appreciate it. And you can always check out our website, ranking76.wordpress.com, where you will find a link to all of our social media, our email. You can see the scorecards. You can check out the other episodes you may have missed. Um, We really appreciate it. As always. I'm Eric. And I'm Matt. Guten nicht. Tababon. Tababon.